Hi, are we ready? Great. Um, welcome everyone to the first in our animation essay, stakeholder engagement talks. Um, we're very excited to bring you this series of talks to uh, give some feedback on what we've been doing in the animation industry uh, at Animation SA. Uh, we haven't had much of an opportunity to connect with our members and stakeholders over the last year. We haven't had our animation festival, we haven't had our exchanges, so we're doing this all online. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing Nick Kluter to you today. Uh, Nick has been the chairman of Animation SA uh, since 2015. He has been doing an extraordinary job coordinating all the efforts of everyone who has been involved and um, working particularly and specifically on what we call sector support which is working with the, um, the larger stakeholders in the industry um, around policy and legislation, amongst other things, um, to ensure that we are uh, well represented and our interests are represented at every level. So um, I'd like to introduce Nick to you. Uh, welcome, Nick, to the talks and series. Um, how are you doing today? Doing fine, Kanda. Thanks for the intro and thanks to Guth for putting this on. Great, good. So um, I believe you're going to be talking about uh, specifically what Animation SA is doing to build, sustain, and create opportunities within the animation businesses uh, or the animation industries. Uh, you're a business owner yourself, Nick. How long have you been in the animation business? We first incepted Mind's Eye in 2011, so I suspect it's been almost a decade. Wow, a decade yeah. in business. So yeah. you know the ins and outs of doing business in South Africa. Very strange of it, for sure. <laughs> okay, great. I won't take up any more of your time. I'd like to hand over to you. Um, thanks very much for joining us. Great, thanks. So yeah, for everyone tuning in online, thanks very much. And thanks for taking, uh, making the time and taking an interest in the industry. We realize, like Candace saying, that we haven't done this in quite some time and it's our responsibility to actually engage with our stakeholders. And so we thought it was high tide and that's why I'm very grateful for this platform so we can actually communicate with you what it is that we have been doing and to make sure that's entirely aligned with the, your interests. So anything we say here is tentative, but it is stuff we are doing and we'd love to get your thoughts on what we are doing and making sure that it is something you want us to do. And obviously the better ideas should always prevail. So if you have any ways that you want to be involved or anything that we are doing, if you feel that there's something better we ought to be doing, please let us know. There's quite a bit of content because there's quite a bit for us to get through. So I, I think without further ado, just so you know, my key portfolio is sector support is kind of saying. So the session today is going to be focused on the trading conditions for professionals and studios. So it includes policy, legislation, regulations, really dry stuff, but ultimately with massive implications. So I'm glad that you guys are tuning in to take the time. So let's get into some of the nitty gritty of what we're going to be talking about. Things like what decisions the Department of Labor has been making in terms of uh, its intention to deem persons in film and television as employees uh, for certain sections of the Labor Relations Act. So I can tell you what those sections are, and it's quite 
debatable as to whether it's going to have the desired effect for those who are pushing for this to happen. But in effect, they want to deem people operating in film and television as employees, and they want the industry to regulate the conditions of employment in one of two ways. Either they want us to establish a bargaining council, which is formally regulated and established by employers and trade unions in terms of the LRA, and then this bargaining council can conclude co collective agreements and request the minister to extend those agreements to other parties who are not signatories. And therein lies the concern. But hang on, I'll get there. The second thing is that we have a non-statutory uh, bargaining forum that will operate through collective agreements uh, that the parties will agree to. And then the parties can then request the minister through the National Minimum Wage Commission to establish the sectoral determination for the industry and have those agreements being considered as inputs to those conditions. So it's a bit of a thing, but effectively the two things is a bargaining council and the sectoral determination. There we think, okay, so, so effectively what is the issue with that? Well, in the department's own words, and I'm gonna read it out here. The fact that the industry is very intricate and diverse, which means that it will not be possible to have custom conditions of employment for all subtectors within the film and television industry. Okay, so this is especially true in animation where we potentially cut across all sectors and subsectors. We form part of the multimedia value chain across the board, including short form commercial, long form film and television sectors. You know, so agreements reached by others may not work for us. And even agreements reached by some of us in one sector won't necessarily work for the rest of us in another or even in the same sector. And so everything is project dependent and varies depending on scope and deadline. So if one set of rules can't even apply to one stakeholder, us being in animation, uh, what is the likelihood of it being able to apply effectively across the board to all in our entire industry? That's a big issue. So now the second thing that they critiqued of their approach is the fact that they need people in the industry to retain their status as independent contractors in order to still be able to offset expenses incurred against income received in the course of a tax year. So employees, for those of you who don't know, it's tax code 3601, independent contractors, tax code 3616. In order to be able to offset expenses incurred against income received in the course of a tax year. So the question is, is it possible to be deemed both employee in terms of the labor law and independent contractors in terms of tax law? So those who are pushing this want to maintain the tax status in order to claim back on deductible expenses, and they want to retain the rights to contracts so they can negotiate on contractual terms, which they claim doesn't apply in practice because of the imbalance of power, like with broadcasts and performers. So the biggest problem with this is that the statutory common law in a dominant oppression test requires that employers like ourselves determine whether workers are independent contractors or employees. If we're audited and SARS determined that we failed to make the right determination, then we're liable for the deductions and penalties. So those who want this to happen are confident that the applicable sections of the LRA won't have any tax implications. But I'm not so confident about that. I don't know why they are, because there's been no collaboration between the Department of Labor and the receiver of revenue. And those are the two bodies that would ultimately make that determination. In fact, they're so afraid to even broach the topic with SARS because they're worried that they may lose, lose the independent contractor status. So if you're already nervous at the outset, why are we trying to do this is part of the questions that come to my mind. And the third is the fact that the, in terms of performers, if the actors, for instance, are deemed employees, they lose their moral rights, their exploitation rights, and the rights over ownership over the image. So yeah, it's only very s certain sections of uh, the Department of um, the Labor Relations Act. So national minimum, minimum wage, uh, compensation for occupational injuries and diseases, basic conditions of employment, and I think it's section 198B of the Labor Relations Act. So those are the applicable sections. Is it enough for them to actually lose those rights? And we're kind of worried about that because remember, animation represents artists and producers and studio owners across the board. So we have to make sure that everyone's 
our interests are represented. So, you know, we have performers who are voiceover talent. So we have to be concerned about their well-being and for them to ma maintain their tax status. So, and one thing they didn't mention was the fact that th what the obvious cost implications are, at least they're obvious to employers, because there's a statutory implication and limitation for employees, which is 45 hours per week. So less hours per day means more shooting days. I checked with uh, some of the commercial producers and they say their average shoot is about two days, but it ranges between 14 to 16 hours a day. So if you're as constrained to that number of hours a week, it means that there's less, so there's more shooting days. More shooting days means higher production costs. High production costs means the South Africa may not land the jobs. Less jobs, less job opportunities. It doesn't just affect live action either. It affects you know, the VFX studios who would have gotten the work had the live action guys gotten the work. So the question is, what is the Department of Labor? What do they want to do? So their way of thinking is that they want an informal self-regulation framework whereby sub-industry collective agreements will be concluded to be made by a sectoral determination on request to the Minister of the De Employment and Labor. So all that means is whatever ag agreements are concluded by the parties in these agreements is going to be extended across the board to different sectors. What are these sectors and subsectors? We don't yet know because we don't know how we're going. But as I said before, we cut across the board. So to what extent are we going to be affected? So if uh, a high value commercial shoot is X and the expectation is that we pay voiceovers Y, but it's for a development job and we, th those rates will no longer be applicable because it's prescribed by these sectoral determined rates, then can we do that work at all? No. And then it allows a lot less contractual freedom in that case. That's, and the second thing that they're proposing is a collective bargaining process through an industry bargaining forum that will enter into collective agreements and request the minister to extend those agreements to other parties in the industry. Again, it's prescribing, it's trying to find a one size fits all approach across the board. And not, by the way, neither of these options actually addresses the moral rights and exploitation rights and rights of ownership for the performers. Okay, so why is this happening? What does ASA recommend? What are we doing about it? Okay, so it's all based on the presumption that exploitation of performers and crew is rife. So they have to get government to intervene. And that's why the Department of Labor is here. Um, so those pushing for this to happen want self-regulation where we can decide amongst ourselves how the industry should be regulated, but they want it to be enforceable by law. So they want to be deemed employees so that they are empowered to collectively bargain. And that that's not possible for independent contractors. That's why they're doing this. Um, they want to introduce standardized contracts, but they want them to be mandatory, not voluntary. And the claim is that there are enough industry associations that have agreed to self-regulation and enforcement by law via sectoral determination. But so far as we're aware, there are only two. And it's just the main proponents and their union partners. That's all we know. And for good reason. So they want to agree on minimum conditions and rates uh, and be properly consulted on and get the minister to make that determination. And this is a common theme across the board with both the Department of Labor and the Copyright Amendment Bill, which we'll get to later. So anyway, ASA recommends that we have an informal self-regulation framework that will not give rise to any form of collective bargaining in council and or sectoral determinations. Um, that's where we would like to go. But also given the fact that the department has taken that off of the table, we'll have to come up with another solution and we're actually scheduled to discuss this more tomorrow. So we're hoping to keep you guys posted on that. But if anyone has any questions about that particular cause for concern, uh, do let us know in the chat and then I can maybe answer some of those questions as and once they come. The other thing uh, that we're trying to do at the moment, if you guys have noticed, how often do you see locally animated, uh, locally produced content on television? How many locally made goods do you see on TV? You know, for those who, of you who do watch linear um, broadcasting in SA, so just for those who are unaware, there is currently no inclusion of local content quotas for animation. We've met with the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies and that team responsible for creative industries. And they identify animation as, as one area that government could uh, cause some growth and export of South African talent. 
So we advise them to include local content quotas so local broadcasters are compelled to invest in and contribute to animation to some extent. And for those who, have, who don't have a producing experience, there are many different models. You, you either get a commission, in which case they pay you outright and they own whatever it is that you produce for them, or it's a co-production, in which case you both proportionally raise the funding, you share in the IP proportionally, or it's a, a pre-sale or pre-buy, in which case they'll pay a portion of whatever it is that you need to fund the works, or they'll license pre-existing content, but that already assumes that it's already been made. So there's, there's different models that they can employ, but we're saying any one of them is fine with us as long as you're making an investment in animation. Because ultimately the long-term goal for most studios involved in entertainment is to own the rights and the work they produce. This way they generate the revenue for the exploitation of the IP and not just through the service work, which we manage to secure through a financial year. It's being able to generate passive income is a way for studios to become self-sustaining well into the future. So that is currently underway. We've actually made that formal submission through the, the Department of Spot, uh, Sports Arts and Culture Reference Group, as well as the IRG Master Plan. We're going to make sure that that reflects there, which would be very exciting, different uh, change for the trade, because uh, uh, thus far, children's programming that they put in there, it's it's been you know, it hasn't really included live action. Uh, so we're really hoping that will definitely change the landscape. Which brings us to the copyright amendment bill. So, uh, but before I move on to that, let me just see if we had any, okay, no, no questions. Okay, the copyright amendment bill has deterred investment and commissioning opportunities for the local industry because of the provisions of the bills. Local studios were anticipating service work opportunities from big brands who were all especially interested in working with South African studios, but they all opted out because they could not trade in a climate of legal uncertainty. Now we have won a portion of the fight because ASA was directly involved with the inception of the Copyright Coalition. Uh, and we, because of that, we made some representations to the presidency and they cited all of our concerns in the president's response. And we were thrilled to know that the president's recommendation was to send it back to parliament. So now that's what is happening with the bill. And I, I believe that uh, parliament has reopened. Now it's a question of the portfolio committee. What are they going to choose to do? And that we want there to be widespread consultations for them to make that determination. But the biggest thing for us is that we need the bill to be redrafted because in its current form, it contains provisions that will have unintended consequences for the creative economy, harming the very same people the bill aims to protect. It will fail to be practically enforceable. It fails to meet international treaty requirements like WIPO. The language and definitions are confusing, conflicting, and vague, which will create a climate of legal uncertainty. And the last point is that it will not withstand constitutional muster. And so even if it were to, uh, if, it, if it has um, uh, achieved its stated objectives and does not cause harm, it will fail to protect the creators if ever tested. You know, so the current draft contains provisions which constitute arbitrary deprivation of property. So I'm going to give you a few examples um, because I think it's important that we actually pin this point because everyone thinks that this is a controversial matter that opposing factions and misaligned interest groups. So there are some interest groups that are operating and very cynically, pessimistically, they're only concerned about their own interests. Um, and it's the nasty producers against the, the poor creatives that won't actually make it. Again, ASA represents a broad spectrum of professionals who operate within the space. We are both proponents for the artists as well as the producers. We have to concern ourselves with their interests their interests have to be aligned. So this bill actually does neither. It only, it only advances the interests of the users, not the creators. So if you are developing a piece of intellectual property, this bill is not for you. It doesn't protect your interests. And especially if you're in animation and there's very good reasons why. So part of the unintended economic consequences is something, uh, section 8A which is unwaverable retrospective royalties. So 
if you as a studio, if you've ever used a voice of a performer for your commercial work, whatever it happens to be, say Kellogg's decides it's going to commission you uh, to produce a 30 second ad. And then you produce that ad and you use that voice over talent. You are expected, or your client is expected to pay royalties on that voice over talent, which are retrospective and which are based on net profit. So they exploit that property. Say like Kellogg's sales goes up by another 20%, whatever that marked revenue, it's based on net profits. That performer is expected to get a share of those net profits. And therein lies the problem because no one in their right mind, no international brand will bring the work to South Africa under those conditions. It will not happen. So the performers believe that this represents their interests and this is going to generate them more money. It will generate them far less. They will get far less opportunities if this bill is passed in its current form. Make no mistake. The second thing is section 39B, which is contractual override. So if you and I want to enter into an agreement, we mutually decide that this is mutually beneficial, then whatever those provisions in that agreement, it is going to be overridden by that section. So you cannot contract out of something that the bill prescribes. So if it says that the minister says that these are the rates, and if you can't use those rates, too bad. Oh, you want to you wanna allow me to buy out? Because I would need buy out for this particular project. I would need to own the voice, the usage for the voice. I need to consolidate all the rights. Nope, not possible. Contractual override strictly prohibits that. So there's even less opportunity for people who want to operate in the space. Limitation of copyright assignments. So within... 25 years that goes up, it's not even a reversion of rights. So, so their thinking is that there's a lot of people get a really bum deal. When they enter into these agreements, what they realize is that they want a better deal. So what they're thinking here is that if we make it so it's only 25 years, the rights then revert back to the copyright owner, and then they can renegotiate the terms. The problem is, especially when it comes to audiovisual works, is that the producers have to consolidate the rights. So uh, audiovisual works are made of all kinds of components. So there's, com there's a composer, there's uh, performers, uh, there's the, the, the character designs. All of these different things form part of the collective rights. And we have to consolidate those rights. So if that expires, if one person involved in the making of a film or a series doesn't agree so then renegotiated conditions, that property is useless. No one's going to be able to make use of it anymore. No one can benefit from it anymore. And what you, know, what you can imagine is a massive, massive issue, especially if we want to move into the IP space long-term. Section 14.6 makes it so that it legitimizes parallel reimportation, which means that foreign distributors can reimport our content without consequence, and they can compete with us domestically with cheap re-imports of our own work. That is effectively what this section entails. Section 23 allows for sub-licensing agreements. So yeah, without your consent, your licensees can conclude sub-license agreements without the licensor's your permission. And the bill may say unless otherwise prohibited, but in the context of the bill, the word prohibited means prohibited by law, not in terms of making the right subject to the agreements to the contrary. So yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a horror fest. You guys have to, I know it feels like a bit of a muddle, but I would absolutely recommend you guys look up these respective sections and see for yourself, apply your minds to actually understand what these sections mean and what they mean to you. And then of course there's, Fair use, um, section 12A5. Now, in principle, we're not opposed to fair use. This isn't a fair use, fair dealing disagreement. Um, but the claim is that it's modeled broadly off of section 107 of US uh, copyright, but it isn't. It is nothing like it. In fact, it's, it has an overbroad, extensive list of co exceptions to copyright protection. So it lists general exceptions from copyright protection which by the way, includes cartoons and caricature. 
And given that animation and cartoons are used interchangeably in common parlance, does that mean that animated works won't enjoy copyright protection in the future? And you may think that that's an absurd idea, but if you look at the unscrupulous people who would try to get around the legislation, that is precisely how they're going to choose to interpret the bill. And with the way it's currently drafted, they can get away with it too. And not to mention that many, many artists within our trade actually produce caricatures. That's part of their work. They produce caricatures and they sell caricatures. Um, so yeah, there's a massive, massive distinguish, uh, distinction between that. It's also different because in US copyright, there is a, a, a statutory infringement penalty. So if the person is deemed to have violated your copyright, uh, they would be required to pay you a penalty. So there's some form of, they, they were trying to dissuade people from doing that, which wouldn't is not something that's in this bill. And if people say, oh, but it's fine because all the creators will have access to a copyright tribunal. Um, by the way, the laws and regulations for which still need to be established, it, you may be accessed, you may be given granted access to the copyright tribunal, but not to the legal practitioners who need to represent your case. And you know, the pro bono legal practitioners who'd be willing and available to represent the creator's case may not specialize in copyright law. Uh, there's also no provision for costs like, you know, th that they'd be able to claim back on. Um, so all the costs of the trial would be for your expense. So you lose money trying to protect your rights in this case. So as an example, like the D design tribunals currently have, a, I think, a one year backlog, which means that infringing parties will be able to continue to use the creator's work until the matter is adjudicated and the ruling is made. And unlike the US, there is no compulsory statutory damages, as I, as I say. So there's no deterrent for bad faith actors. So yeah, uh, we also don't have the 200 years of jurisprudence to inform all the rulings. All of the, anything to do with fair use is a judge made law. They'd need to start looking at these cases and start making ruling on these cases to be precedents to establish precedents so that you know where you will land on certain issues. Whereas with our current fair dealing, it's possible to, to issue an interdict ordering infringing parties to cease and desist to prevent further exploitation of copyrighted work. So that's at least one benefit that we are currently more protected than the prospective draft. Um, it would also be the minister would be able to prescribe rates. Can you imagine what that would be like? Imagine going to, not just the minister, go to anyone who doesn't understand anything to do with our industry, which is so varied. And so many of us do so many different deals. Uh, we can do deals for different reasons. We can minimize the cost in one respect. So we can, in order to, you know, we do this deal and we'll do the next one for a higher premium. There's all kinds of reasons why all of this is always going to be in flux and it's a project by project basis. And it needs to remain that way. But can you imagine what it's like having a third party prescribe your rates for you in terms of what you should be expected to pay. It's just a no-go. People are not going to touch this. There's too much risk involved if the minister is prescribing rates. Now, luckily, we've actually had some success because initially the bill was any works made with state funding would be owned by the state, which, you know, for the for the most part, if you're operating within SA, it's the DTIC uh, film incentive, it's IDC funding, which is part public, part private, and whatever local grants you can get, which are mostly primarily state. Uh, so in all these cases, you wouldn't own any of the copyright that you know you're developing under those conditions. And luckily, that was removed from the the in the current draft of the bill. So we have had some modicum of success, but with all these other things still being in the way, we're not gonna enjoy any of it. So you, got, you guys can get the picture. I wanted to try and page it, paint the picture as vividly, however depressingly as possible, so that you knew why in vivid detail, why this isn't a matter for debate. It's not a question of, oh, it's this side versus this interest group. It's just how these things will practically apply in the real world. 
and for the most part, we believe that the entire process has been unconstitutional because the bill was initially classified as a Section 75, which basically it isn't because Section 75 means that it doesn't affect culture or aspects of trade and education. And Section 76 does. So in what way is film and television not affecting culture, aspects of trade and education? It is the very embodiment of those things. So, and also because of the fact that there was insufficient consultation, I think that they drafted the bill, they circulated for comments and they gave five working days for people to be able to input. So there, there, there was a select committee for trade and international relations and they screened all of these different uh, viewpoints uh, that were submitted within five days. That's all anyone had, all respondents had five days, which I, we think is absolutely appalling and insufficient. So yeah, for, for this and very many other reasons, the copyright bill is incredibly problematic. And if we want to steer our long-term future in animation, we absolutely need to do something about it. So we are going to fight tooth and nail to prevent this bill from being passed in its current form. And we're going to cooperate and collaborate with government because you either get involved or you work with whatever conditions are given to you. That is what we have learned. And we, I absolutely, I don't think that this is this hostile engagement between government and private sector. I think it's cooperative. But I do think that the drafters of the bill were thoroughly ignorant about the way that copyright, and it's very complex. I mean, there are different forms of intellectual property. There's patents, designs, trademarks, and copyright. Copyright is one, but one of four different pieces of intellectual property. Um, so it's very complex. And especially in the audiovisual sector, it's extremely complex. And all of these things are all interleading and interlinked. So it's up to us to help advise this process and we're absolutely um, determined to do so. So we will work together with government and the portfolio committee will make our submissions and we will ensure that the bill is redrafted um, and given adequate consultation with all affected stakeholders to ensure that we have a legislative environments and framework that encourages the creation of original content. So do we have any questions before I move on? Where can we read the current version of the bill? Okay, I will share that link on the Zoom. You guys can look it up yourself. Um, you can even look up a copyright amendment bill. I think the most recent versions from 2018. And you can look, uh, there's a lot of literature. Um, I think that a lot of different academic groups actually have this readily available online. So you can have that. Yeah, look it up at any time and look into all of these different provisions that I've mentioned and see for yourself. Okay, so if there's no other questions on copyrights, uh, we're gonna move swiftly along to another kind of incentive, which is section 12J. So um, it's, it's part of section 12J is the Income Tax Act. Uh, it's an incentive which was created to stimulate economic growth and create jobs. So it's a tax deduction providing investors with 100% write-off of their investment in the year in which they invested, on condition that the investments were made into qualifying SMMEs, So, which is great. But the problem is that if all of you, any of you, happen to hear the budget speech, you'll learn that the sunset date for this incentive is the end of June. So the way I see it, we have some options. If Parliament can be persuaded to take alternative course of action than simply discontinuing the incentive when it expires, here are the options insofar as I see it. And again, we're, we're, we want everyone to be actively engaged. So if you guys have any other ideas, do let us know. So we would recommend that, that Parliament does option A. We either get Parliament to reject Treasury's policy and extend 12J, we, or we extend and amend 12J so it only supports medium and high risk projects, including film and television, because par part of why they thought to discontinue with the program was because it was being exploited by people who knew, the venture capitalists who knew that it was a very low risk venture. And so they would get their returns and they would get a massive tax deduction. So that's why it's, it's quite a cynical kind of thing. But our way of thinking is that, okay, if it's a straightforward thing about the, the risk, the perceived risk, 
which I definitely think is arguable because given the, the advent of the pandemic, it's not clear cut that these are necessarily low risk ventures, especially if you're investing in commercial property, say, um, which is really suffering right now. So, but I do say, I can say with confidence that I think that film and television are medium and high risk ventures. So if we did that and explicitly asked them to include film, uh, which would include both features and series, that may be one way that we can protect this. Because what, what do we want? We want more investment in local content. And if, if the state is obviously at this moment um, deeply uh, troubled with its fiscal concerns, then we have to try to see if we can source private funding elsewhere. So we have to incentivize the private sector to want to produce and invest in local animated content. So that's why we definitely think it does need to exist. Um, or the, th the third option would be to accept Treasury's policy and allow it to lapse on the proviso that they replace it with a more efficient incentive, more fit for purpose, that they deem to be more economically beneficial. So those are the three proposals. We actually have to make a formal submission for motivation to maintain this incentive, but I do think it is worthwhile. So let us know your thoughts on that, um, if any of you have the inclination. Uh, just let me get to this one question that Jenna shared. What do creators do in the meantime while animation is negotiating with government? That's a, that's a good question. Look, I think if you can make your voice heard, just saying, tell your story, knowing how the bit, um, I suspect that you're referring to the copyrights amendment bill, uh, but if they understood where you were coming from and the fact that you now understand the implications of the bill and how it would affect you personally. I think it's important for the presidency to know that, but you, you would have to actually make your submissions to parliament. So it would be via the portfolio committee. We'll try and see if we can get their contact details and make that available. But you, you also have to make representations as professionals and say that this is how this would affect you personally. And if you need any further clarity, do get in touch and we'll help you know, try and, for us, we try and make sure that every position that we are representing is the most legally tenable position. So we, we always get legal advice to, to know that this would actually be how it would work in practice. So do let us know and do get in touch. And then we will, we, we want your voice to echo what we've been saying in the detail it needs to, and to know that you are the concerned people who are being affected by the bill. Okay, so then 12.0. This is another great incentive, guys. Um, it provides the exemption from normal tax income derived from the exploitation of rights for approved films. So when you start generating revenue from the exploitation of whatever it is that you've made, that would be exempt from normal tax, which is pretty awesome because it just means that there's more opportunity for you to make profit on it because it is a high risk venture. I mean, there's so much investment, it's especially animation that necessitates massive human resources over extended periods of time. So this is another way we can make it viable. But this too, unfortunately, also expires mid-June. So like 12J, we also have to make recommendations to keep this going. So we, can, we do intend to motivate why it needs to be renewed. And we also think it needs to be amended to enable SA films to be more internationally competitive. So we need, it needs to include international key costs and the qualifying criteria be revised to include short films, series, and even reality shows for exemption, because right now it's only feature films. Uh, you know, otherwise it would preclude producers from producing quality locally produced television content who might otherwise not have the capital to make a full length film. So we want to make this as inclusive as we can. And then, yeah, so that's 12.0. And if anyone has any questions about that, please just specify when you leave any questions in the Facebook comments. And then Jenna will relay that to us and we can answer. But in the meantime, I'm going to move on swiftly to tax credits. Um, so we think it would be a really great idea to introduce a tax credit system in order to encourage more international service work. We know that the fiscal is very pressurized. We know that even the film incentive, we were concerned that it would be in jeopardy. And if the film incentive is in jeopardy, just so you know, for, for foreign uh, servicing alone, that created eight and a half thousand jobs 
in I think it was 2019, 2020, um, which would be uh, a travesty if that goes. And by the way, 94% of which were um, uh, inclusive. It was transformed. That is one of the most transformed spaces and it's one of the most maligned, but that is not what the data indicates. So we do have to do what we do. But my thinking is that if we offer a tax credit, unlike the form incentive where the government has to apportion the beginning of every financial year through the division of tax, um, it wouldn't be necessary in this case because it could potentially be based on eligible labor spend. So, you know, there's two types of tax credits. You can get a refundable or a non-refundable. And a good case, uh, case in point would be the Canadian tax credit system. So it's got two. It's got one that focuses on creation of film and television programming within Canada. And it wants to develop an active domestic independent production sector. And you get 25% of qualifying labor expenditure in a tax year. It's obviously capped at, um, it does have its own caps. Everything's got caps, but it's capped at 60% of total production expenditure. And the, the other one is, is pretty much the variant of our foreign form incentive, which is 16% of qualifying labor expenditure. Um, its primary purpose is to promote Canada as a preferred location for foreign and Canadian owned films, which we absolutely need to do because it's not just a question of our domestic concerns. It's global positioning. We have to consider how competitive we are with the relative to the rest of the world. What is our value proposition? And are we offering the very best in incentives to secure the work in the very first place? If the question is, the answer to those questions is yes, then the more work we get, the more transformed the industry is going to become. Its growth will invariably, inevitably lead to inclusive economic growth and transformation. That is the very best way to do it. Um, so yeah, uh, that's pretty much where we stand on that. It, I know it's gonna be a long time coming. We do think it does need to be administered through the South African Revenue Services because it's a very straightforward process in that case. You pay whatever you pay in labor spend, you get a portion of that back or you can pay it back to your clients. And then they're encouraged to continue to bring the work to, and there wouldn't be contingents on whether there's sufficient funding or not. And you wouldn't be um, at all limited in terms of how much uh, your production costs. So this is definitely what I think would, uh, we would need to do. And then I think we have time, Kanda, correct me if I'm wrong. We are at 2.42, how are we doing for time? Yeah, we're good, Nick. Um, is there anything else that you want to explain? Uh, yeah, I suppose there's the, the film incentive in terms of us working with the Department of uh, uh, Trading Industry uh, and Competitiveness. Uh, we're working with them uh, on an animation incentive, which we're, it's been a while. It's been a number of years. We've had a few engagements, but we're told that they're, they intend to unveil that very soon. But I thought that one of the things we should do is just say what about the existing film incentive isn't quite tailored in a way that we need it to be for animation purposes. Does that make sense, Kanda? Yes, great, thanks. Okay, cool. Okay, um, so, yeah? No, carry so, on. Uh, as long as we're good for time. So in the, the existing incentive, the producer fees are limited to two working producers, inclusive of all their travel, accommodation, and living expenses, which in animation isn't really a big thing. It's in live action, it's absolutely essential. But they're excluded from QSAP to the extent that they exceed the lesser of 10% of the total company's TPE on the film production or one rand, one million rand, you know, in total. But given the number of line and supervising producers involved in long form animation projects, 1 million is wholly inadequate in animation, especially if it's spanning over three years. You know, so you have different projects, it's different formats, but they can span anything between 18 months, three, three and a half years. Um, so that's why that definitely needs to be corrected. Um, general business overheads, um, anything that is 2% of the total TPE or in excess of 200,000, cannot work for animation given that we're in live action you know you go to different film sets and you're only paying very specific office costs but in animation 
your studio is your set. All of your performers and, you know, they, they go to recording studios, but your talents, your, the people who are actually creating the performances are the animators. And the studio overheads can be in, immensely high if you're talking about trying to fit, you know, 100, 150 people for long form animation. And uh, you're paying maybe hundreds of thousands every month. And uh, if you're constrained to 200,000, that obviously doesn't work for us. Um, connected party fees. If you're the applicant and anything exceeding 40% of the TPE, um, in animation, almost all production expenditure is connected in cases where the holding company, which is the one that applies for the film incentive, is the animation studio because it needs to provide its services to the SPCV. So, you have to incept something called the SPCV, which is a special purposes corporate vehicle in order for you to do any work. It needs to have its own financing so that the government can see it's very clear auditing and accounting. Um, the SPCV must contain the IP and all the money on that project and it must contract the animation service company and the service company will supply a budget to the SPCV for the services. That is how it works in animation. When you apply for it, you expect as a studio that you would be servicing that project. So any, but if it's only linked to 40%, then that can't work because it's going to be well in excess of virtually all of our costs. So we have to correct that. So yeah, in a nutshell, we need reliable, predictable, competitive and accessible incentives to create certainty, even if it's conditional. Uh, we need a legal framework which is aligned with international treaties and best practices in order to instill investor confidence. They need contract flexibility. We had a meeting with Netflix recently, and that's one of the things that they absolutely reiterated over and over again, contract flexibility. We need a sustainable domestic ecosystem demanding locally originated and produce animated works. And so we are absolutely committed to this. There's so much more going on. Uh, there's white papers for the audiovisual and there's white papers for the arts and culture and there's the master plan process in which we need to invest film and publication board regulations and all of those implications but that in a nutshell are some of the the key things that uh, we've been doing and that we still need to do and we need your help to do in fact and we want your inputs and any ideas that you have to share uh, please do Thanks so much, Nick. I see there's another general question that's popped up in the chat. Um, how often does Animation SA advise the government when they're developing policy or is it always in retrospect? Do they actually approach Animation SA when they make decisions? I suppose it depends on which stakeholders because this is perception that um, you know, government is this wholly inadequate uh, system and they kind of make the decisions in, in a vacuum and in isolation. In some cases they do, but there are actually very, very competent people that I think are at the helm that you know, are just the biggest pleasure. And they do engage with us and they do ask us for our inputs. But unfortunately, there are some things that do get lost in the works. And the Copyright Amendment Bill is one such example and uh, there are stuff like the, the Department of Labor issue as well. We know that the, the performers and um, we're trying to push for that to be pushed through. And um, they were quite cynical about approaching what they deemed to be producing entities, industry associations. But as, as we reiterated again and again, ASA represents the artists as well as the producers. So it's not just about their interests, it's everyone's across the board. So, you know, we care about all of your collective interests. So yeah, there's some things that have been lost in the works, I'm afraid to say. And we have to backpedal and we have to catch up and go, whoa, 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 <laughs> what, what is happening? And usually it's uh, some really astute legal mind that has to bring it to our attention and they have to, the, to walk us through those different provisions. And we have to figure out those implications and we have to, we have to advise them to tell them how this works and how our industry operates. And that's, that's the truth. And, you know, even the best legal minds would need to consult with us to be able to draft this very, very complex legislation. So, yeah, it's, it's a back and forth. That's why I say this is a cooperative process and we're absolutely determined to remain engaged. But yeah, unfortunately, yeah, so much of the stuff has been lost in the works. So we are trying to catch up and prevent the bad things from happening. So. 
Right. Thanks so much, Nick. So there's been questions about, uh, or you've mentioned a few times that uh, people should get in touch. How can they get in touch? Uh, you know, obviously we send out, as Animation SA, we send out newsletters uh, to our members with details of what's going on and how they can get involved. But generally, if people have a question or want to talk about any of these matters, how do they get in touch with you um, representing the uh, sector support? Well, if anyone has any inputs on anything related to sector support, yeah, I encourage you to get in touch. You can just email chair at animationsa.org and that's how you can do it. If it's anything related to my portfolio, if it's anything related to the festival, you can in touch with Dai from a director. I think it's director at sataf.com, kataf. And yeah, so we're going to make it so this. we used to have a lot of volunteers, but the volunteers kind of fall away over time. And that's just part and parcel of how it works because we're all volunteers all trying to do what we can to play our parts in the trade. Um, but yeah, for the most part, when it comes to sector support, you can get in touch with me. Thank you so much. Um, we have a comment coming in. Thank you, Animation SA and Nick, for all you are doing. Exciting possibilities ahead, despite the challenges. Um, are you feeling generally positive the way we're going and where we're, we're going? Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling positive. Look, the point is, it depends if you've been listened to. And uh, Isabel Rock and I have been part of the reference groups for the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. I think that she asked, she, she posed the question about Section 12J. I hope that I covered it to the extent that you needed to be done. I know it's critical for one of her programs um, that is expected for the human in innovation. Um, I, I know that it's critical for that. So for that alone, you know, we're going to push on that very, very hard. Uh, that's a lever that needs to remain firmly in place. Great. And, um, and I think that was, yeah, there was another question. How often does ASA advise governments when, oh yes, that was the question you, you just replied now. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in order to stay uh, up to date with latest developments, um, typically we, like I mentioned earlier, we have our animation exchange events where people engage and have these conversations. And we also have, uh, often uh, stakeholder engagements at our animation festival. There's exciting news coming about, up about the animation festival soon. So please stay tuned to our social media channels um, and sign up as members to, to get our newsletters later on in the year. Um, I see there's another question coming in. Uh, ah, it's a comment. Uh, well done to Animation SA and the team. Um, Thank you. It's been informative. Um, the other thing you've mentioned, Nick, is that uh, we represent a wide range of interests from the business owners to the professionals, uh, the, work, the um, working professionals, the students, the educators, and anyone else who wants to be involved. And I guess that uh, the, we can... The, the more people that contribute to the conversation, the better we can represent all interests. Great. Absolutely, yeah. So I think, kind of, if I'm not mistaken, I think that there's some workshops at the end of the week on Friday. Both, I don't know if that's, I think it's just the one in Joburg. I don't know about the date in Cape Town. Yes, it's Friday as well. We'll have networking events in uh, Joburg and Cape Town, toasted in Joburg and the electric in Cape Town. Uh, please RSVP if uh, you intend to come uh, because we have to uh, be mindful of the COVID regulations and keep the numbers within the venue capacity. But we are doing online talks um, throughout the week. And uh, I'm also running a workshop series in the morning. So to anyone who is listening, uh, if you want to get involved in uh, unpacking some of the policy and strategy for animation going forward. Uh, please respond um, and email uh, Jenna at animationsa.org and let her know you would like to be involved with the workshops tomorrow and Thursday 
from 10 to 1. And then next week on Monday, we're going to have another conversation. We're going to have a panel discussion. Nick's going to be joining us again for that panel discussion to field any other questions that you may have um, about the topic. So um, let's see, uh, Nick, is there anything you want to say in closing? No, all good. I think uh, shout out to Clea and to, to Michael and to everyone else who tuned in to listen in. It's really great that you guys make the time and uh, take the interest because, yeah, unless we are actively involved and we actually do something to circumscribe all the terrible things that can happen and all the positive things too, because all of these are actually opportunities if we can just get involved enough and just in the right way. Uh, so yeah, tremendous opportunities in future, we think. Great. Thanks so much, Nick. And we will okay. be having uh, stakeholder engagements. Uh, we'll carry on with the, these um, throughout the year as much as our um, resources will allow to ensure that even if we do continue with lockdowns and virtual ways of working, that we can engage with everyone and, uh, and work collaboratively to solve our problems and take advantage of the great opportunities in this industry. Um, I've just seen another question come in. Are we going to live stream the exchanges for those not in Johannesburg and Cape Town? Uh, yes, that is the plan. We are looking at um, reviving the animation exchanges. Uh, we just have been watching what's been happening with the COVID lockdown regulations. Um, and looking at developing an online version. And if you would like to get involved with that, uh, again, please get in touch with us at Animation SA, uh, either through our social media channels um, or uh, email chair at animationsa.org or jenna at animationsa.org. Is it .org? That's .org, right on. Okay, got it right. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Nick, for joining us today. Um, I am uh, sorry, trying to do something here, trying to show our sponsors. There we go. Hold on a sec. This is online working. Always fun. Right, so in the last few minutes, I just want to say uh, again, thank you very much to our sponsors for allowing us to the opportunity to connect with all of you um, online uh, through this series of events this week. Please have a look on social media pages, sign up for the talks, sign up for the workshops, come join us for the networking parties and um, we would like to explicitly thank uh, the Goethe Institute and the Curve platform for uh, sponsoring and supporting these stakeholder events. And um, to all of you out there, get involved, be heard, join the conversations, and hopefully we will be uh, stronger together in the future. Enjoy the rest of your short week, guys. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. Who's here from Goethe? Hello?